Well, welcome to Front Range, and that story is why we exist. I mean, I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that welcomes anybody and everybody, no matter the season that they're in, no matter what they're walking through in life. And church, I'm just so grateful for you. I'm grateful for our future and what God has in store for us. And we say this every week, that our hope and prayer is that this has become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus, no matter where you're at in your walk with the Lord right now. And uh, and no matter whether you're in person, whether you're online, that's our hope for every single person. And I want to let you know about a couple things that are happening uh, uh, this week, actually. Today, we have our very first Parent Connect Night. Uh, this is an opportunity, if you've got kids, it's an opportunity to meet other parents, uh, maybe in the same stages that your kids are in, or maybe not, just meeting other parents in our church. And then we're going to have a conversation around uh, how do you have boundaries with technology? Uh, if you have kids... Uh, th this is probably something you're talking about right now. I met a couple uh, after last service, and they had a little baby, and they're like, they're already getting addicted to it. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, it's so challenging. And so we're just going to have the discussion around, man, how do we do a good job as parents with boundaries and technology and all of that? And so if you want to have that discussion, you want to meet other parents, come tonight, 630 at our ministry center. You can get more information by scanning the QR code on your worship guide. Uh, you can go to the uh, family uh, tent, the family ministry tent out there, uh, or you can go to our app or online. There's all kinds of ways to figure out uh, and to register and all of that. So we'd love to see you uh, tonight at that. And then baptisms, already mentioned this, but next week, if you haven't been baptized, or maybe you're like me, you were baptized as an infant, and it wasn't like really your decision, and you've come to Christ since then, and you want to tell the world, like, this is my public declaration uh, of what, what I'm doing to follow Jesus, uh, then we'd love to, to have that with you. You can just check the uh, baptism box on your card, or you can scan the QR code, or the app, or all those other things that I just mentioned, and we'll follow up with you this week. Or just come next Sunday, we'll have extra change of clothes and towels and all of that stuff uh, for you. So it'll be an awesome time of celebration. Now I'm excited about today and continuing our series. Uh, I want to start off by asking this question. How many of you, you grew up with an allowance? Anybody grew up with an allowance? Raise your hand. Let me see. Okay, all right. A few, a few more of you. Last service, they didn't know what an allowance was. Uh, an allowance uh, was kind of like the first participation trophy. Uh, it was just given to you by your parents. It was like they were expected to just give me money. Every week I was expecting money from them. And most of the time I didn't have to do anything. Uh, there, was, there was a few things I would have to do from time to time, maybe like mow the grass. But even that, I was asking for more money uh, if I did that. Or cleaning up my room. Uh, you know the things that like, I make my kids do now for free? Uh, I did and I got paid for it. Uh, and so I love the allowance idea. But the older I got, the closer to having kids I got, I thought... This idea of giving free money away, this is not smart. Like that's not, it's not sustainable uh, long term. The government should listen to us on this one. Uh, and sorry, I shouldn't, I, don't go political earnest. Okay, um, where was I? Uh, allowance, yes. Uh, so now I have kids uh, and I've had to decide like, okay, how are we going to raise them? We have a 12 year old boy, a 10 year old girl. Uh, and they're very different when it comes to money. My girl cannot keep money in her pocket. It's like burning a hole. She's like, I got to spend it. I was telling her this morning that I was going to tell uh, everyone that. She was like, Dad, can you at least say something nice? Uh, the nice thing is she does buy gifts for friends and stuff like that. So she uses her money for good, but she cannot keep it at all. Uh, my son, on the other hand, he loves to make money, to earn money, to get money, whatever he can do. And then he saves it up. And so he's got a ton of it, and then he buys this huge Lego set or like three Lego sets at once and all that. And my son, because uh, he understands the value of money, he's always asking us, how can I make money? I mean, he probably asked that question 400 times in a week, every single week. I'm like, just be quiet, and I'll give you an allowance. Like, that's all you have to do. Uh, no, I don't do that. But... So we're always having that discussion, but I don't know, go clean my car, go do something, you know, and uh, my wife had a brilliant idea one time. It was a few weeks back, a few months back, and we were picking up our dog's poop for like the 800th time, and she's like, why are we not paying somebody to do this? Now, that's not the brilliant idea, okay, because I don't think you should be paying anybody to pick up your dog's poops. Uh, in my opinion, you just get rid of the dogs, uh, but since that's not an option in our house, uh, we said, I said, okay, what's your idea? And she's like, why don't we ask Wyatt? if he wants to start a pooper scooper business and we'll be his first client. I'm like, great. So we pitched the, the, the idea to Wyatt. I'm a good vision caster. So I'm like, hey, Wyatt, here's what you can do. And he said, yes, I'm starting this business. We are now his only client. Um, and so here's how it works. Every week uh, he has till the end of the day on Saturday to pick up all the poop in the yard. If he does it, he gets paid. If he doesn't, guess what happens? 
he doesn't get paid. Okay, so there's many times he goes outside and he, he's picking up the poop and uh, he comes back in. He's complaining. He's like, I'm tired or there's so much out there, you know, or it's cold or whatever it is. Like whatever the excuse is, he comes back in. I'm like, that's fine, buddy. You don't have to do any more, but you're not getting paid a dime. He's like, well, he's grumbling, goes back outside and he picks up the poop. What am I doing? I'm trying to teach him a principle that you will be paid what you are owed. Right? Like we all understand this principle. You're going to be paid what you are owed. Oh, now this is a principle that's also found in Scripture. It's a principle that we're going to be looking at today as we continue our series called the, the, the Road, A Journey Through Romans. Here's what we're doing. We're looking at what's called the Romans Road, uh, which is five verses and 16 chapters of this book called Romans. So it's five verses that really point to one thing, points to salvation. Now here's what we've done for every series. We've created these message series hubs. You can get to them through our website. You can get to them through scanning the QR code. You can look on the app. There's all kinds of ways to get there. And on these message series hubs, we've just provided you with resources. We did a survey a few months back. The majority of you said, I want to grow in my knowledge. I want to grow in my faith. So we said, okay, as a church, it's our job to, to resource you, to help you with that. So we've created these message series hubs to really help you dive deeper into whatever book of the Bible that we're studying for that series. So there's something to watch, something to listen to, and something to read uh, on those message series hubs. So you can read a book, or you can just listen to a podcast, or you can watch a video, or whatever. So if you're wanting to grow deeper, wanting to get a little bit more understanding of God's Word and how it can apply to your life, then go to the message series hubs and you can get those. The book of Romans was a, a, a book, it was really a letter written by a guy named Paul. He wrote it to the church in Rome, super creative name. Uh, this church, they were disunified about a bunch of things. They were complaining about uh, different ways to do ministry, that, that you shouldn't do this and you should do that and, and that type of thing. And Paul's like, hey, none of that matters. Like the methodology doesn't matter. It's about our core beliefs. And so he's trying to put them back into, onto the same page about what our core beliefs are. And he's really focusing on one core belief, and that's the gospel. Now, maybe you've heard that term, the gospel, before. The gospel is simply this. It's the good news about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Simply that. That's what the gospel means. It's the good news about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's about salvation. It's about how you and I can be saved in our lives and have eternal life with God. And so Paul writes this book to, to help us understand, like, uh, okay, how do we focus on the gospel? And he, there's five key verses in this book that really help us get to salvation. We've already looked at two of those. Romans 3, 23 says, all of sin and fall short of God's standard. What's his standard? It's perfection. We looked at that week one. Week two, we looked at uh, Romans 5, 8. It says, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. If you miss any of those messages, you can go to the Message Series Hub. You can get those there. Today, we're going to, follow, we're going to continue the series and, and this next stop on this road, and it's Romans 6.23. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, no worries. It's going to be up on the screen. If you need a Bible, go to our Connections tent. We'd love to get you one. Here's what Romans 6.23 says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to repeat that. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is one of the very first passages that was ever shared with me. In fact, this was the first passage that I ever memorized. Because I felt like with this passage, uh, we really understood the story of man, the heart of God, and the truth of salvation. That through this passage alone, you got to understand the story of man, the heart of God, and, and the truth of salvation. I love this passage, and I geek out over studying passages like this. You see, you can read a passage like this and just move on. But if you do that, you're probably not going to get all that God has for you. There's probably so much more that God wants to impart to you. He wants to instill in you that he wants to, to use to transform who you are and your thinking and all of that. But you've got to dive deeper into this passage. And when you do that, and that's why we created the message series hubs. And when you do that with this passage, you see that Paul's contrasting three things. That in this one passage, he's contrasting three different things. The first is this, the master that is served. So he's contrasting who you and I serve in our lives. That it's either or. We either serve sin or we serve God. That that's the master that we choose. That we choose in all of our lives, we choose one of those two things. The second thing that he's contrasting is the outcome of your choice. He says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. 
So sin, if you serve that master, then it results in death. And if you serve God, it results in eternal life. And then the third thing he's contrasting is the means by which this outcome is attained. Meaning, how do you receive death or life? And with death, it says it's the wages. It's what you're paid. And then with life, it's a free gift given to us. I love how he contrasts these three things because ultimately what Paul is saying is that, hey, you have a choice. That every one of us in here has a choice in life. When it comes to God, when it comes to sin, when it comes to our faith, and all of that. And before you make the choice, you have to understand how this choice is going to impact you. We do this with everything in life, right? Like you think through the possibilities. Okay, if I do this, this could happen. If I do this, this could happen. Sarah and I did this before we moved out here to start Front Range. We're like, okay, well, we can stay where we are, and here are the possibilities. Or we can move, and there might be challenges and great things and all of that. And here's the possibilities. We were what? Counting the cost, as the Bible says. It's what Sarah's mom was doing on our wedding day when she said, Sarah, you don't have to marry him. There's still other choices out there. You think I'm joking. I didn't know about it until years later, thank God. And no, I'm not still bitter. <laughs> Ms. Dubas. No, I'm not at all. But that's what she was trying to do. She's like, hey, Sarah, there's more, there's more fish in the sea. I promise you that there might be a better one out there. Like you've got to like survey all your options. And then it, once you do that, you make a choice. Paul saying, hey, here's the options for you. You can serve sin and here's the result. You can serve God and here's the result. It's your choice. But I just need you to understand your options. Ultimately, he boils it down to two things. The first thing Paul says is that sin pays in death. Sin pays in death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. If you choose sin as your master, if you choose to serve sin, if you choose to worship sin, to go after sin, to put sin above God, it results in death. That phrase wages is the Greek opsoneon, and opsoneon was a military term, um, and it meant a payment for someone's service in the military. Now, that payment most of the time was food or drink. So they basically were like, hey, we'll keep you alive so you can keep fighting for us. Very rarely did it have to do with money, but every once in a while, it, it did, they did pay them in money. But the word means this like cold, stern transaction. Like there's no emotion attached to it. There's no passion. There's no gratitude. It's like you did this. You're serving in the military. You get paid this. It's simply that. And Paul's saying that the wages, this, this stern, cold transaction, the wages of sin, if you participate in sin, is death. That's the payment. Now, what does it mean to die? Well, he's, obviously, there's a physical death. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, God says to Adam and Eve, do not eat from this tree. If you do, you will surely die. There's also a relational death. We've seen how sin causes divorce, sin causes relational challenges, sin causes, I mean, lists of things that we've seen, right, and that we've experienced ourselves, and sin can cause many of those things. Sin causes relational death. Sin primarily causes spiritual death. And this is what Paul is trying to highlight here when he uses this word death. He's highlighting that when you and I participate in sin, it's you and I separating ourselves from God. It's you and I creating this, this, this chasm between us and God eternally. It's what we call hell. Now, I've been in ministry a long time, and uh, probably the number one question that I've been asked, and a question that I've asked myself is, is this, why would a good, loving God send people to hell? And maybe you've asked that question before. Maybe you've heard that question asked before. Maybe you walked in here today, or maybe you're watching online, and you're going, man, that's a good question. Why would a good, loving God send people to hell? And I think this passage actually answers that question. Here's what I believe the answer is. God doesn't send people to hell because of their sins. Now, some of you are like, whoa, hold on. I grew up in church. This is what I've heard my whole life. Let me explain what I mean. Because I think when you study scripture, it's pretty clear to see that God doesn't send people to hell. People choose it. Like, it's not God's choice for you and I to send us to hell, send some people to hell and some people not to hell. It's our sin. 
For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is a separation between us and God. You and I choose to have separation between God. And if we don't give ourselves time to repent and to turn to him, then when we die, if we chose to be separated from him, that continues in eternity. It's really that simple. C.S. Lewis, who's a great author, brilliant author and theologian, said it this way, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. It's our choice. A good loving God never would send us to hell, but he would allow us to choose it. For the wages of sin is death. The result of, we get this in every aspect of life, right? We get that like our decisions have, have consequences, good or bad. We understand this in everything. Like for me, I, I can choose to go eat uh, cheeseburgers from, from Crave or buffalo chicken mac and cheese from the Great Divide or Yolanda's queso or, or drink sweet tea and, and chocolate milk. I can do all of that, but I know the wages of all of that is more fat. I know the wages of recreational sports for me is more surgeries. <laughs> the wages of Taco Bell is, I won't get that graphic, but you know, you know what I'm saying. You know what we're talking about. Like, we all understand that, like, if you do this, this could be the result. Why is it any different spiritually? Like, why is it, why do we think it's different when it comes to our sin? If we choose sin, we're choosing hell. God never made hell for you and I. He made it for the fallen angels. He put them there. And then we chose sin. And our choice of sin causes a separation between us and God. And if the story ended there, there would be no hope. There would be no life. There would be no freedom. There would be no joy. There would be no eternal life with God. There would be none of that. But the story doesn't end there. And the next thing that Paul says is that not only does sin pay in death, but grace gives life. Grace gives life. Look at the end of verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God. Like, you don't earn this. This is a gift given from God to you and I. And this is what separates Christianity from every other major religion. From every other major religion. Mormonism says you have to earn God's favor. Christianity says God gives it. Islam says you have to earn God's grace, but Christianity says God gives it. Buddhism says you have to earn God's power, but Christianity says God gives it. It's this free gift that he gives to you and I. It's not something that we've earned. It's not something we should even expect, but it's something he freely gives to you and I. Have you ever been given a gift that you weren't expecting, but it's exactly what you needed? Like, has anyone ever stepped into a time of your life that you had a major need and they gave you a gift, not because it was your birthday, not because it was Christmas, not because it was a thank you for something you've done, just simply because they wanted to give you something. If you've ever experienced that, you understand the gratitude, you understand how much that can transform whatever you're walking through in that moment. And back in 2019, um, a bunch of graduates from Morehouse College, they were sitting at their graduation ceremony. Morehouse College is a primarily African-American college in Atlanta, Georgia, primarily for men. And the commencement speaker that day was a, a guy named Robert Smith. Robert Smith's a billionaire. And so as he's talking to the crowd, as he's talking to these graduates, about halfway through, he says, hey, by the way, my family and I have decided that we're going to pay off all of your, all of your debt. Can you imagine, imagine like being in that moment, knowing that like, wow, this is great, but I'm starting the, they said the average that day, the average person in attendance, or the average graduate had $45,000 in debt. And that guy paid it all off. It was millions and millions of dollars. Wow. What an incredible, incredible moment. Unless, of course, you graduated in December, then that would have been terrible. <laughs> I would have been so angry. <laughs> but that gift was unexpected. It was undeserved. I mean, most of us graduated with some type of school debt. Why do they get it? 
this same guy chose to. And when God looks at you and I, the gift that he gives to us is not because it's our birthday. It's not because it's Christmas. It's not because we deserve it. It's simply because God loves you. God's grace brings you life. God's grace is unearned, undeserved. But he gives it freely because of how much he loves you. And it's simply on us to receive it. That's it. It's really that simple. And so what does that mean for some of us? There's two groups of us in here. The first group is those of us who we haven't ever received that gift. Maybe it's your first time in church or first time tuning in. Or maybe, maybe you've been coming all three weeks of this series. And literally every week of this series is about salvation. Because the whole Romans road is about salvation. It's like trying to get everybody in the church on the same page. This is what matters most. If we can get this, we can actually change the world. Because it changes us, and then we get to go change others. So maybe you've been coming for three weeks, and you're like, man, I've, I've heard this. Why not come home today? Why not open up your arms and receive, open up your hands and receive what God has for you? That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. doesn't mean that you have all the questions answered. doesn't mean you still won't have doubts. But it means you recognize that you're a sinner. All of us are. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. Perfection. None of us are perfect. So I'm a sinner. And I believe and receive what Jesus has done on the cross for me. That Jesus died for me. That he paid the price that I owed. I owed death, and Jesus died for me. And so today, that's you. It's my invitation to you is to receive what Christ has done for you. I begin this new journey, this new faith, this new life in Christ. And the second group of, of us, if that's not you, then you're in the second group, and the second group is those of us who already call ourselves follower of Christ. You're already following Jesus. You've accepted what Christ has done for you. And I was praying for you this week and praying for myself this week. My prayer has been, God, may we know that this isn't just like a one-time commitment or one-time receiving of your grace. I don't know about you, but I need God's grace every day, like moment by moment. Because I'm tempted, tempted to sin moment by moment, and I need God's grace and I've been walking with the Lord for about 25 years. I know for some of you, I seem like a baby in my faith. For others of you, I, I'm super mature in my faith. I don't know where you land, but for me over the last 25 years, here's what I've learned. That when you start to follow Jesus, the enemy is going to attack you in so many ways. And he's going to tell you lies. And he's going to try to heap shame and condemnation. It's Rachel's story of what she was talking about. She has this experience, she finds out she's pregnant, and immediately there's shame. That's not the Lord, that's Satan. He's the one that heaps shame on us. And you go two chapters after this one, Romans chapter 8, and you see a verse that says, for now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One of my favorite passages. Like you're not condemned anymore. Once you accept Christ, that's not for, that verse isn't for, for people who are spiritually disconnected. That's not for that first group I was just talking about. That's for the second group. Those of us who say, man, I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe in this thing. I've received this thing. It says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're feeling condemnation in your life, if you're feeling shame, if you're feeling like you failed as a parent or you failed in your marriage, or you, whatever, name it, whatever it is, like we've all experienced this, that's not from the Lord. And God wants you to walk in his grace today. Every day receive his grace. That our great God sees you and knows your name. And he died for you. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. True life. Not a life that starts one day, but a life that starts today in Christ Jesus.
That in Christ Jesus is so important because it means in a relationship with him. So if you're not experiencing that life, ask yourself, am I in a relationship with him? And if not, take steps today. What does that mean? It means, man, try praying. Try getting into the word. You don't feel like, don't feel like you've got to have a PhD in this stuff. You don't. You just have to take steps. So if you're not a believer today, if you're spiritually disconnected, if you walked into this place or watching online, you're like, man, I, I've never received that grace. Receive it today. Open your hands today and receive what Christ has done for you. And if you have, but you're walking in any type of shame or condemnation, any type of regret, it's not from the Lord, receive his grace in your life and walk in freedom today. Walk in hope today. Walk in joy today. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Romans and just how powerful this letter that was meant for a church in Rome, for a whole bunch of house churches there. Thank God how you use it for us today. That Father, it wasn't just meant for them, but it's meant for us. And Father, may our focus everything that we do be grounded in the gospel this good news that you Lord Jesus you came you lived a perfect life you died on the cross for our sins you paid that penalty of death that I was owed but you didn't stay dead you rose from the dead three days later to show your power over sin and over death so that we could be alive. So, Father, for that first group, if that's you, if you'd say, man, I walked into this place and, man, just feeling spiritually disconnected, feeling like my relationship with God has been non-existent. Maybe you didn't even believe in him when you walked in these doors. Well, this whole time, God's been speaking to you. It like, sends a real thing. And the result of it is death. And we choose that. But there's another choice being offered to us today, and every day, a choice of life through this great gift of grace in Jesus. So if that's you, with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you'd say, Ernest, today I want to receive. God's grace in my life. I want to receive what Christ has done for me. I want to commit my life to Christ or recommit my life to Christ today. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. None of that. Just in this moment, if that's you and you want to make that decision, you want to receive what he's offering you today, I just want you to put a hand up. I want to know who to pray for. Amen. 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 Father, thank you. From the youngest to the oldest in here, who are responding right now, your grace in their life. If you're watching online, you can simply text the word follow to a number on the screen. If you made this decision, I want you to know that God rejoices. In fact, the Bible says that when one person repents, when one person turns, when one person receives this great gift being offered to us, that all the angels are rejoicing. And we rejoice now with you. It's the greatest decision, not the easiest, but it's the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. I promise you, as a church, we'll walk with you in the midst of it. God, thank you. And then for all of us, God, I pray that for any of us who feel like we've just been walking in condemnation and shame, feeling like we have failed as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, as a follower of you, Forgive us, but help us as we receive that forgiveness, God, to not walk in shame and condemnation. May we walk in the truth that now no one stands condemned, but those who are in Christ Jesus, no one is condemned. We stand in that today. I pray we would walk in that freedom today. Help us to walk in that joy. And God, help us to make decisions that are in line with your word, in line with who you are, in line with your heart. 
God, thank you. Thank you, Father. Tell us what to do now in Jesus' name.